This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We are broadcasting from our new printing press studios here in Manhattan. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez, and we stay the last few minutes with Jane Hampshire before going on to the 25th anniversary of Bhopal. Jane Hampshire, founder of the blog FireDogLake.com, has launched the campaign One Voice for Choice. But the larger bill, Jane, explain where it stands now in the House and the Senate, the health care reform bill, and uh, where the public option stands and what exactly it looks like in both uh, in House and Senate. Well, in the House right now, they've just passed a bill with the public option. It's a weakened bill that isn't available as widely as anyone would like, but they did pass it. The Senate bill has, against all odds, uh, a public option in it that has opt-outs for states. That was what Harry Reid introduced, though, so that states which have Republican governments and legislatures can you know, opt their states out. But uh, it looks like it's going to get worse this week. Privately, uh, people in the Senate are confirming that Harry Reid is going to try and cut a deal for triggers, which is something that the White House has been pushing for Rahm Emanuel since January of this year. They've wanted it all along. Uh, they've said they wanted the public option, but what they've worked for is triggers. And we always knew that this was, you know, probably going to be the lay of the land. Stupak, I believe, will make it into a conference report. Uh, as you know, after the Senate and House pass a bill, they go into conference and have to merge the two bills. And because Nancy Pelosi is saying she can't pass a bill without Stupak, I I believe that whether Ben Nelson uh, is successful in getting it into the Senate bill or not, I believe that it will be in the final bill that comes out of conference. And so that's why I would encourage people to phone bank with us, to join, uh, to go to firedoglake.com and sign up to either host a phone bank or be or join a phone bank in your area. And Jane, how would the the triggers uh, work uh, if if Reed does decide to uh, go that route? Well, since we haven't seen the legislation yet, uh, we don't know. But usually, if you look at, like, Medicare Part D, triggers are written to never work. Uh, they also made their way into the immigration bill. It's a way of saying, hey, don't we intend to do something wonderful that we'll just never do? And it's a palliative. It's, uh, it's a sleight of hand. And the fact is that the White House cut these deals over the summer with all the stakeholders, the insurance companies, the, uh, you know, the drug companies. And they have intended to follow through on them in order to keep the donations and the lobbying money out of the pockets of the Republicans in 2010. So they are going to try and jam triggers through. And I, I believe that, at the end of the day, we'll be in a situation where we will be asking those members of the House that we got to commit to vote against any bill that doesn't have a public option in it to vote against this bill. Uh, Jane Hampshire, uh, Senator Lieberman from the insurance state of Connecticut, has said the public option plan is unnecessary. It's been put forward, I'm convinced, by people who really want the government to take over all of health insurance. Well, uh, you know, Medicare is a very popular program, and Joe Lieberman takes, has taken more money, I believe, than almost anybody in the Senate from insurance companies, $1.2 million uh, over the course of his political career. But, uh, you know, we, the fact is that the public wants a public option. They do not want to be at the mercy of insurance companies being forced to pay money every month to the same insurance companies that are turning them down and finding ways not to cover the things that are wrong with them. And Harry Reid actually has it at his disposal to go to reconciliation and make Joe Lieberman's vote not count. If he doesn't do that, if he doesn't want to do that, you have to ask why. If he says he supports a public option, is he not doing that? What about the Obama administration's ability to uh, hamper or disarm the progressive movement, what you have often uh, criticized as the veal pen? Could you talk about that? They've been very skillful at the White House in getting the large liberal interest groups, uh, I would say, to be inert in advocating for progressive change. Uh, during the time that we saw the AIG bonus scandal becoming a front and center, the bankers went to the White House and they said, we don't want to be criticized anymore. So the White House made it very clear to the interest groups that they didn't want any criticism of uh, the bankers, and particularly not Timothy Geithner and Larry Summers coming out of them. And that was at the time that the teabag movement was really starting to get going. So all the discontent at the bank bailout, uh, that should have 
have been a progressive issue. But the progressive validators were silent on it at the time, at the behest of the White House. And so all of that energy, all of that discontent that the money is going to the banks instead of creating jobs in this country, went to the teabaggers, went to the right. And now we're seeing the enthusiasm that they've been able to build off of that. So, you know, that's just one example of what happens when the liberal interest groups do what the White House uh, wants when the White House is actively pursuing a neoliberal agenda. I think we're starting to see them shake that off. Uh, the AFL-CIO has been very good in the fight for the public option. Um, Move On has really stepped forward. Uh, you know, there are still quite a few. The choice groups are probably the worst. The environmental groups are, are right down there. But we're starting to see some of them break free as they realize that their interests aren't necessarily aligned with what Rahm Emanuel is trying to do. And why the veal pen, Jane? <laughs> it was a uh, Douglas Copeland in uh, Generation X. Uh, I uh, used it to describe these cubicle warriors who just got their food sent in and uh, lived their lives there. And President Obama and the White House have been very good at protecting themselves from criticism from the left by keeping these liberal interest groups uh, content with cocktail parties and access and, uh, uh, you know, uh, donors that they are able to turn on and turn off when. Uh, these, these groups do what they like or what they don't like. And, and that's why one of the challenges that a real, a real progressive uh, institution faces when they are trying to be able to advocate, you know, purely for a progressive agenda is finding a financial uh, structure that won't make them subject to this. And that's one of the great things about the blogs is because our money doesn't come from those sources generally. So we can be independent. Uh, we rely on our donors, our donor support. Our members, uh, you know, are, are the people who read us coming and supporting us and being part of things like phone banks. And we don't have to worry that George Soros will cut off our, our money if the White House calls him. Jane Hampshire, we want to thank you very much for being with us, founder of the blog FireDogLake.com.